On the rugged Washington coast, situated at the mouth of the Quileute River, is the picturesque Indian home of the Quileute. It is the village of La Push, a typical Indian fishing settlement of the North Pacific coast. Though some Quileutes receive allotments from the government for reservation timber holdings, the majority live mainly from products of the sea. They spend long hours in their canoes following fish runs. They lived in modern frame dwellings. They built wooden houses, which were occupied by many families and owned by them jointly. Opposite the mouth of the river looms James Island, whose jagged rocks were sought by the Quileutes as a fortress and shelter when they were attacked by their neighbors to the north, the Macaw at Nia Bay. Even though the Quileutes were only 25 miles away from their neighbors along the coast, they spoke a different language. This situation existed in many parts of the Northwest, and to overcome it, they developed a trade language called the Chinook jargon. The Indians show how much they have acquired from their contact with whites in over half a century of living together. A teenager who goes to high school at Forks, Washington with her white neighbors, serves her Indian friends with a kind of food the Quileutes have learned to add to their diet. In keeping with other business arrangements on Indian reservations, Business establishments like this cafe are often leased to white men who in turn employ Indians to work for them. The cafe also serves the boys from the Coast Guard station who find it a welcome place to spend an occasional hour of leisure. Canoe making is one of the fine old arts of the Quileute men, who made cedar dugouts of the type famous among Indian tribes along the entire North Pacific coast. Today the canoe is roughed out with a double bitted axe, where formerly this work was done with an elbow axe. Canoes were used for transportation and fishing and varied in length from 12 feet to as much as 60 feet. The canoe is smoothed off with a hand adze, a basic tool used by the Indians of the Northwest for their famous woodworking. This tool, somewhat resembling a plane, is used with a motion toward instead of away from the workman. These adzes now have metal blades, but in the days of the early explorers, they were equipped with finely ground blades of stone. The handles were often beautifully carved and showed the Indian's love for decoration, even on his common tools. The very large cedar trees of the Olympic Peninsula, especially the valley of the whole river, with fine stock from which to make canoes. The art of the women in basket making is as commendable as with other Indian tribes. The base for many of these baskets is the split bark of the cedar tree. Today, baskets are finished with raffia, which is bought ready for use, thus eliminating long hours of preparation of materials. The raffia is sewed with a needle, a new technique for the basket maker who formerly twined the elements with her fingers. Shopping bags can be most readily sold in shops at the nearest towns and to tourists on the reservation. Trinket baskets with modern designs also are popular. These sales give many housewives a welcome cash income to add to the family budget. Smelt fishing is one of the industries in which all members of the family participate. The men pile nets in their canoes in preparation for the catch. The smelt are attracted to the Quileute River because of the gravelly sand spit at its mouth where they spawn. To snare the fish as they approach the mouth of the river, the fishermen must pilot their canoes to the surf, a hazardous undertaking even for those that are such good canoemen as the Quileute. The breakers not only test the canoemen, but also the seaworthiness of the boat itself. These canoes are so well built that they can take the beating in the surf, as well as carry the fisherman and seal hunter 15 to 20 miles out to sea.
bayonets used by the Quileute today are made of commercial twine. But they are constructed like their old ones with wooden floats along the top and sinkers on the bottom. Today the nets are so large that one good haul often fills several canoes. Smelt crews work as a team, those on land receiving less than the men in the canoes. Many of the land jobs are taken by women who are anxious to earn money for themselves or help their families. Smelt are bought for the Seattle market, today's catch being in the fish market 200 miles away tomorrow. The slithering fish are dumped into canoes. While the load is waiting to be taken away, even small boys are pressed into service, namely to sit in the boat and shoo the seagulls off the catch. Out of each catch, the Quileute save a few smelt to be used in their traditional manner. These are strung on cedar sticks and hung by the fire to smoke and dry. Smoked smelt is a favorite winter food among all Pacific Coast Indians. Further north, where the candlefish, a relative of the smelt, runs in great numbers, the Indians render the oil from the fish and use it both as food and as an important item of trade. Even more frequently, salmon is cleaned and hung up to dry. The fish is split and spread with small cedar sticks so that the smoke and air can reach all parts. The old lady is probably talking about the great rows of drying salmon she used to see when she was young in the fishing camps during one of the great salmon runs. Fish are prepared for two purposes, the winter's food supply and coming feasts. Long ago, when there were no store to supplement the dried salmon, the rows of neatly prepared fish represented a winner's security against starvation and hardship. But today, while still used, they are no longer quite so important. On Sunday mornings, small groups of people go to the Shaker Church for worship. This sect was founded in 1882 at Mud Bay, Washington, and is a combination of the Catholic and Protestant religions together with a native guardian spirit cult of the Indian. It is his own interpretation of the Christian religion. Though many reservations have a Shaker church, the sect is confined to the Northwest and is known only from Vancouver Island to the northern borders of California, where it has been carried by devout Indian missionaries. From the Catholic Church, they borrow the bells, the candles, and the practice of crossing themselves. Derived from the old Indian religion is the trembling of the hands to indicate spirit possession. From the Protestant denomination, the pattern of hymn singing was adopted, and the old hymn tunes were combined with some of the rhythms of the Indian musical style. The white robes with the blue ribbon chain and cross applique on the front are undoubtedly a copy of the vestments of the Catholic Church. The robes are worn by both the congregation and the minister. Leaders in this church are licensed by the bishop, but are not paid for their services. Each man has his own occupation and is drawn into the service of his church through his own conviction of its spiritual values. In their services, they parade around the church to the rhythm of bells and singing. 
The individual attitudes of the worshiper reflects the highly personal expression of the Indian guardian spirit cult. The majority of them do not read the Bible. They have, however, a profound belief that their expressions, both in singing and in bodily motion, are directed by God who speaks through them by divine revelation. This gives the Shaker religion the same strong emotional appeal present in some of the evangelical cults and makes each service, in spite of its traditional pattern, unpredictable in detail. The rhythm of the music is irresistible even to the non-member. Holding service at the same time on the other side of the village is the Assembly of God Church. In contrast to the Shaker Church, which draws so heavily upon the primitive Indian religion, the Assembly of God represents a modern Christian denomination which is found in many white communities. The minister is a Klamath Indian from Oregon who is a fisherman during the week and preaches on Sunday. An interesting parallel to biblical times. He is assisted by his wife who plays the piano. But he is also a good musician and plays many instruments, a feature of the service that the Indians especially enjoy. In his missionary work, he has been supported by his own church and by the tribal council who felt the need for some spiritual education for the children of Lapush. However, people of all ages come to his church where they enjoy not only the music, but also his spiritual leadership. Many of the early missionaries commented on the ease with which Northwest Indians learned Christian hymns. It has now become traditional on many reservations for the Indians to have their fest on regular legal holidays. Early in the morning, the fishing begins for the celebration of Labor Day at La Push. Catching fish for the feast is a fine form of sport fishing. This is similar to the old potlatch feasts where the host was primarily responsible for the food. But the guests were proud to contribute their share. Fish are prepared in the old Indian style, being cut the same way as for drying. They are clamped in wooden tongs with cedar spreading sticks set in so that the fish will not curl up during the roasting. The salmon are then set beside a long open fire of alderwood. The fish leaning over the fire, roasting gently, could easily be set back a century to a northwest fishing camp of any Indian tribe. Today it is one of the regional dishes that whites in the northwest are proud to add to the interesting cookery of America. People who have always disliked fish are often converted to the delicacy by this particular method of preparation. Picnic is a good place to observe children 
And La Push has a very healthy group of youngsters who are typical of the new life that Indians in the United States have taken on as a race. At one time, it was believed that the Indian was a vanishing race. But in the last 25 years, his birth rate has increased, and with modern health precautions, more of the children born continue to live. They develop healthy bodies to fight the diseases which Indians received and which almost caused extinction. No feast is complete without singing. So the guests from Nia Bay bring out their drums to thank their hosts in song for the good food. Inspired by this, a guest from the Tohola Reservation dances the simple steps of a woman's thank you dance. These songs and dances belong to families and are inherited much as white people pass on the family stern. Sports are also adopted from the American Picnic, and three-legged races, ACA events, entertain the younger guests. The Quileutes are true Americans in their love of sports, and all the men and many of the younger women are both participants and fans. Many Indian boys become featured athletes in our schools. The most exciting sport for the Indians is canoe racing, beginning with competitions among four-man crews. The rhythm of the paddling seems rather rough in comparison to the smooth rowing of modern shells, but the speed these crews whip up would be tough competition for our collegiate boats. Some tribes make special racing canoes which carry as many as 11 crew members and are often seen at water festivals on Puget Sound. In order to make canoe races even more exciting, a capsize race is set up. In this race, the crew of two men must overturn their canoe, right it, rock up the water, and paddle to shore to the enthusiasm of many interested spectators. When the victorious canoe comes in, the occupants are probably very happy to get out of the wet boat and their wet jeans. Another form of canoe raising adds some modern equipment, namely a 10 horsepower outboard motor to the traditional canoe and the races run down the river. The combination is not an unaccustomed one to the Quileute whose young people spend many hours running their canoes with motors on the river, just like the city high school boy with his hot rod. Outboard motor racing is always tricky and the additional length and instability of the canoe requires much greater skill on the part of its crewmen. Frequently, the lanes are not kept by the competitors and consequent spills add to the uncertainty of the results. While the young people are competing in sports, the older guests resort to one of the Indian customs still practiced throughout the Northwest, regardless of how modern the Indians have become. The bone game is a gambling game which involves guessing in which hand one of the players is holding the unmarked one of a pair of bones. The players and their supporters line up behind the plank each, facing one another, the side hiding the bones, singing and pounding on the plank with sticks. The object is to make as much noise as possible to confuse the ones who are guessing on the other side. Guessing right depends on the shrewdness of the player, who watches his opponent carefully and tries to make him conscious of the hand in which he is holding the unmarked bone and so give him a clue. The game is played with 21 counters, the colored sticks, one being lost for each wrong guess and one side having to gain all to win. 
These games often last many hours, for the stakes which are bet on them are high. At feasts, the game is usually played between hosts and visitors, or between visiting tribes. Every large Indian gathering in the Northwest must have dancing. And today, under the pressure of white people who often think that all Indians must wear war bonnets, the Nia Bay Indians, where such costumes were not formerly in use, have copied the feathered headdresses and other traditional Indian clothing from their neighbors across the Cascade Mountains. They brought over also the Eastern version of the Sioux war dance step, which the men are using. The women are performing a step close to their own tribal style although only the ones wearing shawls are dressed in a Northwest Coast manner. The introduction of these Eastern costumes and dances can be traced to one leader who has influenced several of the coastal villages of Washington. Rabbit dance, which also comes from east of the Cascade Mountains, is a modern version, since in the old days the Indians never danced in couples. It has become very popular in the large part of Western America. Often at feasts where white people are present, these dances draw them into the festivities. The white man's influence becomes more apparent with each new generation since both attend the same schools and have the same educational advantages, the Indian is rapidly adopting the white man's way of life and is beginning to assume his rightful place in society as a true American. Canoe-making is one of the fine old arts of the Quileute men, who made cedar dugouts of the type famous among Indian tribes along the entire North Pacific coast. Today, the canoe is roughed out with a double-bitted axe, where formerly this work was done with an elbow axe. Canoes were used for transportation and fishing and varied in length from 12 feet to as much as 60 feet. The canoe is smoothed off with a hand adze, a basic tool used by the Indians of the Northwest for their famous woodworking. Washington coast, situated at the mouth of the Quileute River, is the picturesque Indian home of the Quileute. It is the village of La Push, a typical Indian fishing settlement of the North Pacific coast.
This tool, somewhat resembling a plane, is used with a motion toward instead of away from the workman. These adzes now have metal blades, but in the days of the early explorers, they were equipped with finely ground blades of stone. The handles were often beautifully carved and showed the Indian's love for decoration, even on his common tools. The very large cedar trees of the Olympic Peninsula, especially the valley of the whole river, with fine stock from which to make canoes. The art of the women in basket making is as commendable as with other Indian tribes. The base for many of these baskets is the split bark of the cedar tree. Today, baskets are finished with raffia, which is bought ready for use. To overcome it, they developed a trade language called the Chinook jargon. The Indians show how much they have acquired from their contact with whites in over half a century of living together. A teenager who goes to high school at Forks, Washington with her white neighbors serves her Indian friends with a kind of food the Quileutes have learned to add to their diet. In keeping with other business arrangements on Indian reservations, business establishments like this cafe are often leased to white men who in turn employ Indians to work for them. The cafe also serves the boys from the Coast Guard station who find it a welcome place to spend an occasional hour of leisure. Though some Quileutes receive allotments from the government for reservation timber holdings, the majority live mainly from products of the sea. They spend long hours in their canoes following fish runs. Lived in modern frame dwellings, they built wooden houses, which were occupied by many families owned by them jointly. Opposite the mouth of the river looms James Island, whose jagged rocks were sought by the Quileutes as a fortress and shelter when they were attacked by their neighbors to the north, the Macaw at Nia Bay. Even though the Quileutes were only 25 miles away from their neighbors along the coast, they spoke a different language. This situation existed in many parts of the Northwest, and 